hope you enjoyed this episode of Audio Signals Podcast, hosted by Marco Cipelli. If you learned something new, and this conversation made you think, then take a moment to rate this show and add it to your favorite podcast player. Subscribe to our YouTube channel and share this episode with your friends, family, and colleagues. We invite you to come back for more stories and follow Marco Cipelli on his social media as he continues musing on stories, storytelling, and storytellers. the guest is ready i am ready and this is another episode of audio signal podcast on itsp magazine with me marco Ciappelli, which also happened to be the co-founder of itsp magazine and i have a couple of shows this is uh, the one that i do for fun let's say because it's about storytelling storytellers and uh, and the meaning of telling stories as human in our in our life i like to say and to start the show always say that we're all made of stories and uh, i'm pretty sure that my guest down ireland is going to agree with me and if she doesn't well she'll let <laughs> me know uh, but anyway that's what we're going to talk about today my other show just for a little bit of advertisement is uh, called redefining society where i talk about technology and society and uh, sometimes they intersect one with the other. But enough about uh, what I do. Let's talk about what Don does. And uh, welcome to the show. Well, thank you, Marco. I appreciate the invitation. And hello out there to everybody. Uh, I'll give you uh, the breakdown of me. So my writing started uh, in a very odd way, so to speak, because I, I started as a technical writer. And uh, the funny thing about that was, uh, we're going back, I'm going to really show my age here. So uh, we're going back to the, the 70s, okay? And uh, at the time, I was an executive secretary, but I worked in the documentation department of this oil and gas company. And the uh, managing editor plopped some stuff down on my desk one day and said, Hey, take a look at this stuff and see what you think, you know? <laughs> and so I did, you know, that's when I invested in red pens and discovered, uh, you know, a whole new talent that I had that paid significantly more than, you know, a little secretarial job. And uh, so I, I transitioned from that company over to Compact Computer, where I worked for about 10 years and from that point on, I learned about the entire publishing industry because I worked in corporate communications and, you know, while we were writing manuals and things for the, the product line, uh, there was also the, you know, the whole publishing part of that. We didn't just write them. We, you know, edited them. We uh, had a printing company that we dealt with. So we went on you know, we had to go to the printing company to check, you know, what they were doing with that. So, I mean, it opened up a whole new world for me. And uh, I'm very grateful to that technical writing. And something that I learned, which is very valuable for writers, is that when you are on a project, whatever, you know, the project is, uh, whether it's a manual or a user guide or whatever, you have a deadline and you have to start with the date that it's due and work back to the day that you start it. And there, there's no, you know, there's no tripping time in there. You've got to make your publishing deadline because whatever the thing is, if it's going to go into a box to be shipped out, you know, there's, there's no slip time. Hmm. So it's so very, let me, let me, let me ask you something, which is, of course, I'm curious about the transition between the technical writing, which is if you're a geek is a lot of fun. Yeah. Right? yeah. I mean, I, I, I talk about cybersecurity. I talk about technology and I love it. So it doesn't matter to me. But then I need the other outlet, which is 
as I started as a copywriter in the advertising world, mm -hmm. I know what it means to work in within frames and I mm -hmm. love to be creative in within frames. If I have yeah. a white paper, I kind of freak out. But if I have a <laughs> briefing, then I can get creative in within those limits. So I'd like to pick your brain in, in this, how you transition. If you already had a book in your, in your mind before, and then you put it in a corner while you were a technical writer, or you just discover something and say, hey, maybe I can write something different. Well, how, how did it go? Well, it happened uh, two years before I started at Compact Computer. Uh, I think it was uh, somewhere around, uh, well, actually, no, it was a little bit longer. I think it was somewhere around 78, 79. Uh, I had a very long commute to work. And uh, so I was daydreaming, you know, driving and daydreaming. And each day, the daydream grew to the point where I finally brought uh, a yellow tab, line tablet and a pen and I had that on the passenger seat. So anytime I stopped, I would, you know, scribble down notes. And uh, that went on uh, throughout that whole, you know, I don't know, it was, you know, like probably several months. And I mean, I had several line tablets filled up you know, and sat down one day and started typing it out. And I thought, wow, this is pretty good, you know? And it was my, my very first science fiction novel. Uh, back then it was called Second Chance, but uh, it transitioned into uh, Prophecy of Fall, which this is what it used to look like. Right. And we just uh, created uh, a brand new cover, which I absolutely love. Mm, uh, cool. Yeah, really nice. So it's really funny about that because, okay, so I started it somewhere around 1979 and I finished the first draft in 1984. Now, what you have to take into consideration is I did not know one thing at all about writing, nothing whatsoever. Uh, so it was not published until 33 years later. I went through draft after draft after draft, change this, change that, you know, uh, luckily I was in a critique group that helped me out. Uh, cause I, I had no inkling at all about writing, uh, what helped when I, started the technical writing job was I learned some of the process, even though it was for technical documents, it, it still transitions into the creative area. You know, you, you have to uh, learn how to set up your book. You have to learn how to, you know, create things on the page. And for God's sakes, I was, I was horrible for years with commas and apostrophes. They were the enemy. <laughs> Uh, this is why you always need a good editor to get you through these things. And now, uh, let me let me ask you. So, thirty years mm -hmm. was it really that different when you finally decide to publish it, or was it something else that hold you from? I don't know. Maybe you wanted to be very like perfect because you know things are never really perfect when you write. I mean, you you can go. Yeah, that's the day true. after, and you you will change something that would have worked just fine. No, I'll, I'll be honest with you, Marco. The first draft was so awful. It was just so awful. My main character cried, I think, about 85% through the book. You know, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know, when you don't know what character. you're doing, <laughs> yeah, when, when you don't know what you're doing, you do the best that you can, but then, you know, uh, as you look at it again and then again and again, then you learn how to really create a story that, you know, anybody would be interested in. Right. right. And I mean, it, yeah, it's, it's sad, but you know, we all stumble through our first book. Oh, wasn't Hemingway that said the first draft of everything is uh, shit. 
but <laughs> said, so, you know, if I uh, said that. <laughs> I'm sure, you know, I, I definitely say that, you know, it's yeah. like, get your... Get but your there is a good idea, there. usually, you know, there is a good idea, you just need to carve it out of, yeah. of the stone, and, yeah. you know, the, 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 the sculpture is already in it. So, but then after that, you ended up, I was reading your bio, having uh, written and published 17 novels, seven nonfiction books, and 15 screenplays. So I guess you figured it out. Oh, yeah, I figured it <laughs> out. <laughs> uh, the, the critique group that I joined back, uh, I think it was around 1984, 1985, they were uh, so helpful to, you know, turn my ideas into something that was worthy of, you know, spending time getting them down on paper. Uh, you know, you've got to have either a good editor, a good critique group, or a good proofreader, or someone to get your work uh, to the point where somebody else can look at it and say, oh boy, you know. I mean, because even today, I mean, I, I read two to six books a week. And it's awful when I read something that has on the cover New York Times bestselling author or USA Today bestselling author. And there's errors all over the place. I mean, sometimes it's like they don't even have their character's name spelled the same way throughout the book <laughs> or that they've lost a dog or, you know, something else that's in there, you know, I mean, it just irks me. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And and when you are in that business, it everything. It's kind of like when you are in, you get into the metrics, then you see the metrics. Mm -hmm. And when you when you and I can tell you this because uh, my wife she's a, a customer on on set of movies. So every time we watch a movie, or anything that has you know the mic sticking out a little bit, or there is <laughs> continuity where you know somebody's supposed to have the tie in a certain way but isn't enough and she just see it like oh, me yeah. as a just a regular i mean now i see it too because i'm like kind of trained like that but yeah I, I see what you say by saying you know i i notice you notice all these things that maybe the the regular reader wouldn't but yeah they it does don't. make a difference yeah it does make a difference the readers really yeah they're so ignorant about what should be on the page and what they're actually reading on the page, you know, if, what are you going to do? Yeah. Well, if they enjoy it, tell me, tell me a little bit more about all this book that you write. Do you have a, a genre, a style that you, that you follow? Is it all sci-fi? Do, do you go from? No, I, I have uh, cozy mysteries. You know, this is one. And this for is the people listening to the podcast, uh, Don is yep. showing me the, the covers of the book. Oh, that's right. Yeah, they can't see it. <laughs> this that. is both, you know, <laughs> some people who like to watch podcasts, some people just like me, listen. Like a, a radio guy. Yeah. I like, I like to listen, which I do also for, for books uh, lately because I can consume yeah. many more. But yeah, so you have different, uh, different genre that you getting yeah so I, I have uh the science fiction then i have some dystopian which is uh that's my last the last dog which is set in 2086 and then i have uh my bonded series which is a billionaire shapeshifter series and i uh, always in the front of each book in that series i have you must be 18 years old to read this because shapeshifters include sex and violence. Mm. So I don't want to get in any trouble. You know, I don't want my young adult people, mm. you know, tripping over there and, and getting into trouble with their parents. And then I have, uh, so then I have the cozy mysteries. I've got uh, two series in, in the cozy mysteries. Uh, and I mean, it, it's the same with the screenplays, except for with the screenplays, they also have horror. Uh, so, and every single one of my genres have won awards. And the thing about that, which I think is so critical to point out to other writers out there, uh, professionals will tell you 
you should stick to one genre. You know, if you go into another genre, you're going to just, you know, lose yourself and your readers and everything else. Well, that's, that's not true. That's not true. You know, I can write just about anything. You know, I'm laughing because the episode that I recorded before this was actually a cybersecurity thing. But the one before is actually with a neurosurgeon that become a writer. Mm -hmm. And and I, when I asked him what is it was going to write the next, he told me exactly the same thing. He said, my publisher suggests me to stick with what I know, with my style, because the reader would expect that. And instead, he's writing something completely different. And Good. this is on the same day, two writers that are saying the same thing. And you know what I told them? I said, you write what you want. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. What makes you happy? Because if it doesn't exactly. make you happy, it's not going to be any good. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Tell me, I'm curious, as, as somebody that both wrote uh, fiction books and screenplay, I mean, this is an entire different technique. Oh, yeah. You know, when, when you write one or the other, maybe maybe our audience will be interested, in, I think, in, in knowing how you approach one versus the other. Well, with a novel, you can, you know, you have the ability to put in all types of descriptions, you know, and that's what the reader wants. The reader wants, you know, to see the environment that the character's in, you know, what the situation is. They want everything spelled out for them. Whereas in a screenplay, uh, you have no more than 120 pages. And actually producers want you know, they, they would be very happy to stick between 90 and 95 pages. Hmm. So, and this goes through also with uh, adapting a book. You know, if you're adapting a fiction book that's 400 pages and you have to shrink that down, which I've done several times to, you know, uh, 95 pages. I mean, it, it's like a lot of things get left out. And, you know, when, when movies get made from books, You've got the book audience people who are infuriated that <laughs> Usually, you know, yeah. all these things have been left out. Well, why didn't they put this in here? It was so important. Well, you know what? You've got uh, you know less than two hours to get it through there. Unless, of yeah. course, you've got one of those big giant blockbusters that's a, a three-hour movie. You know, that's what I would love. Yay, team! You know, <laughs> 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 that would be exciting. But uh, it's very difficult to uh, to write that concise. You have uh, you have very little wiggle room to introduce your character. You you can you cannot say you know Jill is you know thirty four years old. And she has this long flowing blonde hair and she dresses blah 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 blah. No, they want to know Jill is thirty one years old. You know if, if she has any disabilities that are visible, you better you know, line them up right there in, in the beginning because we don't want to know 40 pages into it that, oh, you know, she lost an arm, you know, it's like. Right, you'll see it. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know, and I, I read that in screenplays all the time where, you know, people mm. that, you know, they just, uh, they get lost. They they really don't know what to do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so you 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 have less room and you need to be more specific for for the visual that you're going, that you're yeah. going to create. Do you prefer one or the other? Or is that a genre that you? No, I, I'm, you know, I really love both forms. And uh, yeah, I mean, I started writing screenplays in the late 80s. Uh, because my uh, the uh, agent that I had, the literary agent that I had at that time, uh, wanted me to adapt *Prophecy of Thal* into a screenplay, and you know here here we go again. You know I didn't know what the heck I was doing, and you know you go to the library at that time and you pull out all kinds of books to try to figure out how to do this, and then you uh, find a screenplay that you can read, you know, and see how they did that. And the problem with that is if it's a shooting script, uh, that's not what, you know, beginners use. You know, we are, uh, nobody is paying you for 
the project when you're just starting off. Mm -hmm. And uh, so you don't put in, you know, sounds and you don't put in, you know, all this other stuff, you know, so <laughs> uh, it, it's a, a really interesting learning process. But, you know, uh, I love both forms of the writing. It's a, yeah, I guess it's a different mindset. And, and I think it goes together with, Maybe what I said at the beginning, it, like I like to have like a briefing and say, even if I write something for myself, I say, okay, th this is this is the, the frame where I'm going to be. And, and then in there, I can be as creative as I want uh. to be. While so I'm thinking the script itself, which I never I never write, I never wrote, it could be a different kind of challenge. And, and I think writers are people that that do like challenges. Yeah. Um, well, some do, some don't, you know, some are, you know, stick very close to, you know, their genre and, and they, you know, they, they will not put one big toe outside of <laughs> you know, their, their little, the little world, you know, yeah. <laughs> whereas I'm just ready, you know, where's my spacesuit? I'm going to take off, you know, <laughs> I'll right. do no, it, lo it looks like it from your, yeah. from, from your bio and, and all the thing that you have done. Um, one thing I would like to talk before, you know, the time runs out is the fact that the importance of reading. I mean, you say you read two to six books every week. Um, I know there is a note in your website or maybe it was in your bio about you've been encouraged to read a lot as a, <laughs> as a, as a kid, even the, the cereal boxes, yeah. <laughs> like as long as you read. Tell me about that. I mean, if you're, if somebody comes to you as they, I know they do, cause you consult on this and they say, you know, I want to be a better writer. How does reading more frames the development of a good writer? To me, it's very important, you know, turn the TV off and <laughs> sit down with a book. Uh, people who want to write or they're just learning how to write, they will get so much out of, you know, reading and reading on a steady basis, not just, you know, one book a month, you know, uh, because you're going to learn language skills. You're going to see how other authors um uh, create their whole setup uh, and how things go, you know, throughout the whole process. And, you know, no two writers are alike. So every book that you read is going to be so totally different in, you know, character setups and, you know, the plot and everything else. And uh, one thing I love about uh, eBooks is that if you don't know that word, you just highlight it. And there's the definition. Whereas in the old days, you know, all you had was a paperback and a dictionary, mm -hmm. you know, and when you have to take the time to, you know, get the dictionary out and look up the word, it's taken you so, so far out of the story that it, it's kind of worthless, you know? Mm. So yay team for technology. <laughs> I know. I know. I, I do a lot of audiobook and Sometimes I also be in English, my second language, I'm still learning, obviously. And uh, sometimes there is a word that I think is important. I don't I don't need to know every single word. I can, you know, you kind of grasp it, even especially mm -hmm. when you listen to it. But then I do the same thing. I maybe I'm walking the dogs. I just push the little the little button on my headset and I say, hey, Siri, what's that? <laughs> What's Good. that word? So I, I, lo <laughs> I love how you just, you know, I mean, you, you learn a lot by doing that. And tell me your perspective on reading something that, that you don't like. I mean, follow me here. So sometimes I listen to a podcast, let's say, and I say, I don't like this style. This is something I wouldn't do. Mm -hmm. It's still a learning process because yes. it, I, by comparison, I, I can hear something that I love and that I get inspired and I'm like, okay, that's something I want to get better, kind of like this. I don't know, an NPR, maybe nice <laughs> podcast yeah. or a BBC or, or whatever. And others, they're like, yeah, no, that's not good. But I still listen, maybe, mm -hmm. 
because it kind of make me process the other way around how to get better, even by listening. So do you do the same thing? Do you read book that you just keep going and pulling through? Great. I got disconnected with the video. Oh, where are you? I can hear you, but yeah, I can't. I'll, I'll figure it out. You can go ahead and okay. answer the question. So, yeah, it's uh, I come across things that uh, I don't like and my writer friends laugh at me because I force myself to read it to the end because I want to find out, you know, if the author, you know, could pull the rabbit out of their hat, you know, to save their story or, or what, you know, uh, sometimes, uh, sometimes it works and sometimes it's just, you know, it's just trash, but I will get through it. That's all there is to it. I will get through the damn thing and, <laughs> You know, just, uh, but I thoroughly believe in leaving a review that the book deserves. Okay, so yeah. if I read something that has errors all over the place, or if the, the plot is just so loose, you can't even figure out what the heck is going on, um, then I'm going to, you know, leave a public review and I'm going to say this book needed an editor or, you know, a proofreader or needed research or something like that. Because, you know, when you look at reviews and you've read the book and you know it's trash and the book has all these five star reviews, well, you know that that's family and friends that are just, you know, they're not doing that person any favors whatsoever, you know, because I, I tell people that who read my book, you know, if you find any bloopers, let me know because I want to yeah. fix those. And all it takes is just a click to upload a new text version. Yeah, yeah no, I, I agree with you. I think that uh, the crowdsourcing of of information and, and review as it happened on Amazon for a product, it should be something that is real i mean yes so we, we need to be honest and uh maybe that's uh that's something that you said it may be very useful for the writer itself to to get better at something yeah they um, they have to be able to look at those reviews and see you know if they have shortcomings and if they need to improve something instead of somebody you know saying oh it was just so wonderful you know i mean that does no one any good yeah i agree now let's uh, let's take the last few minutes, and I for the people watching, I had to change my camera because this one didn't work. But for the people listening, voice is still the same. Mm -hmm. I would like to take these five minutes that we have left or less for you to give maybe some advice to someone that it's either a young writer or somebody that is a new writer, maybe somebody that start later in life and decide. Hey, I want to. I want to really write that book. Has been in my head for a long time. Even if I, not an experienced one, maybe it doesn't come from being a copywriter or a journalist and or technical writer, and it's still like learning the role. But it has this desire uh, to. It has this desire to to write. So, what what are maybe a couple of bullet points advice that you can give? Well, I always tell people who want to write and they don't know how to write or they don't know where to begin, you go back to like the eighth grade in school. You start with an outline, you know, just jot things down that you want to have in your book, whether it's fiction or nonfiction, it doesn't make any difference what it is. But if you start with an outline and then you uh, expand that outline, you know, anytime you come up with any kind of thought, just put it in there. And before you know it, you're going to have, you know, you may start off with just a couple of paragraphs, but, but if you keep doing that, you're going to have, you know, five pages, 10 pages, whatever. And then you have something to build a story on. And another thing that I want to put out there to people that are just starting out, uh, try to find a critique group. You know, you can find one through the library or a local uh, college or, you know, any type of school. You they usually have bulletin boards or something and you just, you know, try to find something or 
you create your own critique group and hope that you get somebody in your group that's a good editor. You know, because uh, I had a, uh, a group that lasted for 24 years and I finally retired it. But uh, we had uh, two great editors in that group. And so we all got together every week. Well, sometimes once, once, uh, once a month, once two or three times a month, we would bring pages with us. And then uh, later on, uh, we would email like 20 pages to each of the members. And so they had to read all those pages, mark them up and bring them to the next group meeting. And we would uh, go around the table and discuss, you know, here's what I found, you know, I didn't like this or, oh, I just love that, you know. Uh, you've got all these errors, you know, you learn how have to learn how to spell check, kiddo. You know, <laughs> that's one of my pet peeves. This is the finger that does the spell check. Click it, you know. <laughs> well, I remember at the beginning of the conversation, you, you mentioned a lot of red pens when you started oh, yes. technical yes. writing. So I, I, got, I got that when you said <laughs> that. And I, I have a red pen in my hand, but it's actually a blue pen. It's red only in the color. Um, and I think, I don't know if you agree, but I think a lot of people, yes, think about it, learn. I love the idea of the critique group because you, know, you can't really be a critique of yourself. Um, no, it's, it's you can't. Hard. It's hard. But also maybe give it a go, give it a try. Yeah. I think a lot of people, they have it in them to be really good writer, but they, you know, they're, they're afraid of failure. And I feel like there is always someone that is not going to like it. Oh, yeah. And there may be a lot of people that do. We can't, we well, don't like everything at the same and time. And I, I know that people can't see this, but they can hear this. I, I wrote this tiny little book, very, very oh. tiny. Writer's called Preparation. Writer's Preparation Handbook. And it doesn't make any difference if you're writing fiction or nonfiction manuals or whatever. This will teach you how to get yourself so completely organized that you won't lose things. Because believe me, uh, if you do not have what's important to you in a file folder, whether it's in your desk drawer or on your laptop, or you know your desktop screen or something. Uh, when I was a technical writer, uh, I gave a lot of lessons to the engineers because a lot of times they would end up working with the wrong version of the document. Mm. Lots of waste of time to hunt around to find the right version, and you know that's why people really need to get themselves organized. So this is a tiny little book. Very inexpensive, you know, just get it. <laughs> cool. So I think a lot of people got a lot out of this conversation, even because they'll try to write, they want it already to write, but also a lot of people that love to listen uh, topics related to writing are usually people that like to read the book. I know that a lot of the audience is people interested in learning out yeah. things about authors and what inspired them to write books. And, and maybe it, it helps to appreciate the books that they're reading and that they will read. So Don, I, I want to thank you for being on the show. I will share all the links in the notes for the podcast so that people can get in touch okay. with you, um, get thank uh, you. where your books are. I know you have a website, so that's probably going to be the easiest thing to just send people to, to the website. I want to thank you for your time. I really enjoyed this conversation. I learned a lot and I'm hopefully, I'm hopeful that, uh, People in the audience uh, are learning a lot as they go and listen to these episodes and this in particular with you. So thank you. Well, I, I enjoyed it, Marco, and I, I really appreciate the chance to, you know, get some information out there. Yeah, I, it's, it's, we, we need to we need to learn things so that we can actually appreciate yeah. it. I remember. Uh, a lot of people, writers or musician or artists in general, and I think Picasso actually said this, if you want to break the rules, you need to learn the rules first. That's and, right. And That's then right. you can break them. You can't just not having the knowledge of, 
of what you the art that you that you choose and with that well, and if, if you have any questions you know uh feel free to just you know contact me and the same thing with anybody who you know listens or watches this you know i am open to you know questions and answers you know that's that's a wonderful thing and i hope people would uh would take this invitation and uh, and, and act on it and for everybody listening, please uh, share this conversation, subscribe, listen to many other one that where we talk with storytellers about storytelling and uh, and their their life, their experience, and the job that they that they do. Take care, everybody. Take care. Bye. Bye. Hope you enjoyed this episode of Audio Signals Podcast, hosted by Marco Cipelli. If you learned something new and this conversation made you think, then take a moment to rate this show and add it to your favorite podcast player. Subscribe to our YouTube channel and share this episode with your friends, family, and colleagues. We invite you to come back for more stories and follow Marco Cipelli on his social media as he continues musing on stories, storytelling, and storytellers.